I'm going to get started. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, thanks everyone so much for joining our call this month. It's really exciting to see you all in front of me. Uh, quite different to our normal experience. You can all wave and say hi to each other, which is nice. <laughs> Um, I'm Gina Oliveri, I'm the Grassroots Engagement Manager at Results International Australia. Uh, when I was a little girl, I discovered about two things at about the same time. One was I learned for the first time that there were thousands of kids dying every day of preventable causes, including poverty. Um, and around the same time, my mum gave me a fairy wand with a mirror in, the, in it. And she told me that the magic was in the mirror. So. I felt like I had the ability to do something about the problems I saw in the world and never really stopped seeing hunger as unfair and to this day I'm trying to do something about it. I'd like to acknowledge that wherever we're calling from today, anywhere in Australia, we're calling in from country that is traditionally owned by Aboriginal people and I want to pay our respects to their elders past and present. Um, a quick overview of today's call, we'll hear a bit of an inspiring story, we'll hear from our guest speaker Adele Neal, who you'll also be able to see, um, and we'll also have a chance for questions and answers, so please do think of any questions you have for Adele as she's speaking, and being that it's our first time on Zoom, so, so far things have been going pretty smoothly, um, but you know, we, we may have a few little teething issues, so just be patient if we have any uh, any troubles and we'll do our best to get through them. I just want to draw your attention to um, in the participants menu button down the bottom um, and you'll only be able to see this if you're on the computer, uh, you have the option to raise your hand and when we get to the question time that will be quite useful to be able to raise your hand to see who's got a question to avoid us all talking at once. If you can't find the raise your hand uh, button just type something into the chat and if you're on the phone and you've got none of those options, just unmute yourself and barge in and I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, and also if you have any issues throughout the call um, or you've got something to say and you just wanna make a note in the chat box, then please feel free to do that. Um, I have put the action sheet for this month in the chat box. So if you're on a computer and you're watching the call right now um, and you haven't already seen the action sheet, then you can download it from the chat box. Um, and let's get underway. Uh, I would like to now introduce Alyssa, and Alyssa's going to tell us an inspiring story to kick us off. Alyssa, you are now unmuted. Okay, and can you hear it? Is the sound okay? Yeah, you're fine. All right, hi everybody. So for the, our inspirational story this month, we have a tale about defiance and about cooperation. And I don't think that you would have necessarily heard about this one before, so listen in because it, it is pretty incredible. So our story starts back in 1988. It was in a working class suburb in Washington, DC, and it was the Fairlawn community. So they were concerned about a growing drug presence. Interestingly, however, they discovered by accident that by filming the drug dealers, so having a presence in the community, it actually made them go away. And so they started to walk the streets together in large groups with cameras or phones. And they sat in lawn chairs in people's front yards, just watching for these drug deals. And they did all of this while wearing uh, orange hats and they were very successful. But what the movement was lacking was cooperation with the local police. So neither the community or the police believed that the other cared enough to actually do anything about the issue. And that relationship had to be mended so by exchanging services and demonstrated commitment to a common goal. So instead of approaching the police right away, the movement organizers actually hosted community meetings. So they had some barbecues, some house meetings and church meetings. So they wanted to get a sense of how the community actually felt about the police so that they could then understand where change needed to come from to mend the relationship. So eventually after they had aired all of their issues and grievances and agreed to cooperate with the police, the police were invited to a meeting and they were surprised by the lack of hostility from the Fellon community. So from here, the community alongside this newly invigorated police group developed a common commitment to nightly patrols of the area all still while wearing the orange hats and also using cameras and walkie talkies to assert their presence and defer drug deals. And I'll leave you with a really interesting observation that was made by Mr. Foreman, who now trains different communities around the US on this process. He said that they bring neighbors out because they feel the power within themselves. 
So not only is the community safer, but they also feel empowered. So they've been supported and they've been given space, they've been listened to, and now they can carry on without supervision. So they self-motivate because they feel respected. So as we go through today and talk about relationships and one-on-ones, it, it would be cool to keep this kind of idea in mind um, and talk about the importance of storytelling and relationship building. So thank you back to you, Gina. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alyssa. Uh, yeah, the orange hats at Fairlawn, if you wanted to look up anything more about them and find out more about that story, you can find them online. Uh, I'd like to now introduce our guest speaker. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about our guest speaker and then Adele, I'm going to tell you a bit about the people we've got on the call before we get into our questions. Um, Adele Neal comes from a background in marine biology with a passion for helping communities and protecting nature. After years of volunteering with various climate organisations, she now supports local action groups to run powerful field campaigns as a community organiser on staff at Environment Victoria. She loves working in the world of social change where human relationships and empowerment are crucial. And I hope that we learn about those human relationships and empowerment today. Uh, so Adele, let me tell you a bit about some of the people we've got on the call. We've got people like uh, Lindsay in Hobart, who developed her story of self last month and told it in front of 100 people at a quiz night. And you could hear a pin drop. It was really amazing. Um, and also people like uh, one of our volunteers is Barbara in the Northern Beaches. She wrote her story of self in a letter to her MP. Uh, we also have people like Puya in Sydney City who uh, had an opinion piece published in uh, Online Opinion. And I know there's a few other people who've got opinion pieces in the works and we're aiming to get 10 of those published this year. I also want to point out people like uh, Alicia from our Melbourne group who's had 11 letters to the editor published this year. And uh, our aim is to get, uh, oh, of 30 that we've had published so far. And we hope to get 100 this year. And we had a bit of a run in the Sunraysia Daily in response to Andrew Broad's speech about Australian aid. Uh, we had Peter from Canberra, Sue from Melbourne Hills, and Alicia all get published. So that was really great to see. So these are the kind of people we have on our call today, uh, really people committed to ending extreme poverty and building the political will to do so. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, but now Adele, I'm just going to double check that I've unmuted you, which will help. Um, and uh, Adele, can you tell us a bit about why you think relationships are so important in the kind of work you do? And what are some kind of, uh, what kind of relationships are we actually talking about? Mm. Hi everyone, um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on Boonwurrung country, um, which is near Melbourne. Um, yeah, so relationships are so important because that's the way, it's there. I guess that's the, the foundation of how we interact with each other and, and help us build trust between each other. And often the work we do to create social change is, it can be risky sometimes, it can be really challenging. It can be hard to figure out what to do or even when you know what to do, it, it can just be so much work and so many different things to do and to be able to delegate jobs and be able to work together. Having strong relationships is so important um, and understanding the passions and the um, experiences people have had and, and how they come to be here wanting to do this great work that you're also wanting to do, um, having that sense of understanding and trust so helpful to be able to do effective work together. Um, but yeah, it's important to note that it's not what what we um, try to, in the way that we talk about relationships and forming strong relationships, it's not so much a personal relationship. Um, and so I'm not necessarily trying to make friends out of this, although sometimes that's a wonderful byproduct. Um, but it's actually more about public relationships, which is something that I hadn't really heard of until I started doing community organising. But public relationships is the idea of doing work with someone and knowing them, um, doing that work for the public good, creating the social change for whole community benefit, not just for your own individual benefit. Um, and it, it, it is interesting, though, that sometimes there's a bit of crossover, like you can imagine a... a um, a Venn diagram of public relationship and a private relationship and sometimes there can be overlap as I said before sometimes you become really great friends and that can even make it even easier to work together. Great thanks Adele. So can you give us some examples of campaigns, 
campaigns that you've been a part of or that you've seen where building strong relationships has been really important to winning that campaign? Yeah, absolutely. So I was, um, I was supporting a local volunteer group to be part of our federal election campaign uh, in 2016 last year. Um, a volunteer group who has had been meeting for um, a couple of years already. And so the members of that group already knew each other quite well. Um, and I, I think that those relationships they had with each other were absolutely crucial to be able to work under super high pressure and to be able to do such a massive field campaign that they did. So they were going out door knocking and doing phone banking and um, doing shifts at a local campaign HQ hub um, and going out at polling booths and all this over a just a period of one or two months was just extraordinary. And being able to rely on each other, not only to get that work done, but also to be able to support each other through really challenging, stressful, full on time um, and to be also part of that public political or be on that, um, I guess, in the limelight a bit as well, um, being able to support each other through having strong relationships as um, your other, the person who told the story just before mentioned, super important. Um, and also my role is to support that group and I found that having strong relationships with at least one or two of those um, volunteers in those teams I support it helps enormously to be able to work together to be able to provide leadership and guidance from my sort of organisational perspective but also to be able to get really super useful feedback from the community from the grassroots to be able to do great work together. Hmm. Yeah I've, I've seen it described as that relationships between the members of a movement is the glue that keeps it together. And I think we can probably all relate to experiences where we're, we're working on something super stressful or just something that's coming up and it's last minute and it's all getting a bit hectic. And I think we can all relate to that idea that it's the relationships with the people um, and feeling like you're all in it together and that you know, you're, you're all helping each other that helps you get through and, and pull off something uh, much bigger than any of you could ach achieve alone. So I think we can all kind of relate to that idea of the relationships being the thing that helps us get through and get work done as a team. Um, but tell me, how, how do groups, so like your um, groups that you organise with Environment Victoria, or groups like our results groups, how do they practically speaking build strong relationships amongst the members of the group or between existing members and potential members that they want to work with? Mm. Well, I think um, one way is to just spend lots of time together and be able to introduce a bit of not just work business, but also get to know each other and have one-on-one -on -one conversations that allow you to ask them, why are you here? Why are you passionate about this? Is there some, you know, tell me about some experience or what did your parents teach you or whatever it is um, and you can achieve that over a long period of time but we also have um, been using a wonderful idea which is actually a, a long a long held idea of having one-on-ones one-on-one conversations which are also called relational meetings um, also some people just call them going for coffee which um, even people in you know the corporate world and business world and all sorts of parts of society use that as well. Um, but particularly with community organising, we use this one-on-one -on -one idea as a really quick way. It's like a super quick way to be able to build that much deeper relationship and understanding of why we're both here, why you're here. I share a bit about why I'm here as well to try and encourage that deepening of our relationship. Um, and build the trust that's really important for being able to share ideas and do great work together. Um, and um, what was the other thing I was going to say about that? I think it's, yeah, so that, that has typically been from the outsets of when Ed Chambers came up with the idea of a relational meeting. It's been about a 30-minute 30, 30 conversation and you just do that questioning of it or questioning not in a not in an interrogating way but in a, a genuine way questioning each other 
um, and it's only 30 minutes, but I think you can be more lenient and, you know, if you need an hour, then sometimes it's an hour. And if you want to um, build onto the end of that discussion, some ideas about how you could work together, then that can be a really effective way of spending time as well. Um, but this one-on-one -on -one meeting is, it's really about, um, it's not chit chat and it's not for personal relationships. It's about trying to get to that essence of what drives the other person um, and asking why questions is really helpful for that as well. So uh, not, not trying to give people a way of saying just yes or no, but um, asking why, why did you feel like that? Or why did that make you do this thing? Um, the why questions are super helpful when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. Mm. And um, for everyone who's hearing this, you know, one-on-one, one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one over and over again, it's something that is explained in the action sheet. And if it seems really basic and intuitive, that's because it is. It's not rocket science. This isn't like high technology um, stuff. You know, this is this is doing the things that we already kind of know how to do, but sort of breaking it down to the steps and making it um, so that we can kind of plan it and do it and know that it's going to be effective. Um, and the way I think of it is that, you know, when I have a one-on-one, -on -one, so like Adele and I had a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, a few weeks ago when I approached her to be our guest speaker today. And it's a way of kind of making explicit what otherwise might be implied. You know, it's kind of making explicit the fact that, well, I'm committed to this and you're committed to this and this is how we're going to help each other, um, rather than kind of just thinking, well, I think this is important to them. I think they're in the results group because for the same reasons as me, I you know, but I'm not really sure. Um, and it can just, I think it helps to just make the invisible visible, which, which is really helpful. Um, so I'd love to now open it up to questions for Adele. Um, questions particularly about the importance of relationships in building social movements, in building groups that respond to social issues, um, using your relationships to build power. So if you have a question, please um, either use the little raise hand button to raise your hand uh, or type something in the chat and say, I've got a question. Do whatever you can to get our attention. If you're on the phone, you might just have to unmute yourself and say, I've got a question. Um, and then when you are called upon, I haven't seen any hands up yet. So if you've got your hand up, I'm not seeing it. I'm happy to kick off by telling about how you might arrange a one-on-one -on -one conversation. If that's useful. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Adele. And then, yeah. and then we have a question from Ruby once you're done with that. So go ahead and then I'll call on Ruby. Okay, sure. So um, one thing that a lot of people feel uh, nervous and awkward about is asking someone to have such a deep conversation with them. And I find that um, the easiest thing is just to be able to give that person, may, ask them, firstly, ask them, do you want to have a half hour, hour coffee or chat with me um, and, and make a time for it? Um, and there's some context about, you know, I do this work. Um, this is my job and this is the context of me reaching out to you and I've seen that you do this job and I, would you like to get to know each other better over a chat? And that's as much as I think it needs to be. That works for me. Yeah, you don't have to be all like, let's let's have a really deep conversation about all our thoughts and feelings. Um, yeah. That can be a little intimidating. Um, okay, so I'm going to call on Ruby and then I've got Adelaide uh, and then I've got Hobart. So Ruby, um, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, I guess my question is just, um, so a lot of our conversations are, I guess what we want to get to is having conversations with MPs. Now, what if the MP or the person that you want to talk to, you know that they may not have very similar views um, and what you're wanting to talk to them about, especially in, like, in the results world, if you're talking about wanting, you know, the, the need for more foreign aid and they're on the less foreign aid party. Um, how do you try and build a one-on-one -on -one if you know that you're coming from very different perspectives? Shall I just start answering, Jason? I'll take that as a yeah. Go ahead, yep, go ahead. So I haven't used 
this idea of one-on-one -on -one or, or relational meetings um, with politicians. I can imagine that it could be challenging if, especially if the politician wasn't um, wasn't friendly to your particular issue, um, which sometimes is the case. But often politicians are, you know, they they want to represent the community, and so um, obviously they do they do want to um, hear from you. I think it you probably just want to be careful. I think about whether and, and clear about what kind of conversation and relationship you're looking to have with them um, and and just be cautious or, or conscious that they may not be willing to have such a, a deep public relationship with you as you might um, feasibly and want to have within your organisation. Um, but also, I think if you could have such a, a great public working relationship with a, a politician, that could be a really productive thing. Um, and I also might add that it might also be worth thinking about who has that relationship with the politician. Does it need to be you or could it be someone that already has some kind of relationship or is in a better position um, to, to be building trust with that person? Yeah, thanks Adele. Um, yeah, and I've been grappling with this question too. Like, the action for this month, you know, our focus at the moment is very much about building relationships, um, building our power as a community, you know, building our relationships with people who want to achieve similar things to us. Um, but when it comes to working with parliamentarians, definitely I think elements of relational meetings um, come into play. You know, we want to, you, you sort of have to go through the same kind of steps and you do want to get a sense of who they are and what they're about and what they want the world to look like. Um, so it's definitely definitely useful to um, to do that. And I see that Sue Packham has had a coffee chat with an MP in the past um, and can talk about this. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear about that. So you could, I might go to the other questions first and then come back to Sue on that one. Um, so thanks so much for the question, Ruby. I'll now go to results Adelaide who have their hand up. So I've got Adelaide, I've got Hobart and then I've got Perth if we have time to get through them all. Um, Adelaide, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, Tom here in Adelaide. Uh, thanks, Adele. Yeah, obviously, um, besides building relationships, I think we need to um, draw each other's attention to what's missing in the community or in, in uh, Parliament, in our case, uh, and yours. But uh, the awareness is, is one thing that's missing and what we can do about it. Um, I think environmental awareness is improving. Um, unfortunately, awareness about overseas aid is not improving that much, and we're, we're working on it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just an observation, really. I think, you know, if we can draw potential group members of parliamentarians into a conversation about what's missing, um, they may find, we may found, find some common ground that we didn't know we have. Does that sort of mesh with your experience? Or? Yeah, I, um, I I think there's definitely elements of truth to that. And, I mean, every politician is a human being and has had experiences and may have had experiences that somewhere along the line line up with yours. Um, and I, I also think that personal stories which I know is not the topic of this particular discussion, but that you're all really thinking about at the moment. Personal stories can really um, give a politician a much better window into your own um, passion and, and reason for caring so much. And that's actually in my small amount of experience, but nevertheless, in my experience with politicians, that has been a um, really effective thing to be able to share for volunteers in, the, in the, the politician's own electorate to be able to share their personal stories about why they care so much has been really powerful to do. Cool, thanks Adele. Um, I'm gonna to go to Results Hobart now if you'd like to unmute yourselves in Hobart and ask your question and then uh, we'll go to Perth and then hear from Sue Pack and hopefully we can fit it all in. Great. Um, hi Adele, it's Lindsay here from Hobart. Um, 
I was uh, thinking about public relations and how often uh, there has to be some reciprocal element to it. So when we're talking to individuals uh, to encourage them to take action or join our group or what have you, uh, what we're offering them is um, empowerment. Uh, but what about if we're reaching out to other uh, groups, other community groups? Do we necessarily need uh, a very uh, clearly um, similar objective that we're working towards or are there ways that we can think outside the box um, with um, other community groups? Like what, what I'm asking is, do we have to have something that we can offer them to get them involved? Mm. Great question. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, I'm not sure that I have all the answers on this one, but I, I, I certainly think that building relationships with the um, potential allies through having one ones is a really useful thing to do, in part just because you get to understand um, more about why they do what they do and more about what's important to them and, and it, it, it bring you closer to, and it has for me as well, brought me much closer to getting to the point where you can share honestly with each other about what a useful collaboration or partnership would look like. Um, and, and, and that when once you get to that point, you can share what you would like from some kind of collaboration and find out from them what they would like from some kind of collaboration as well, which um, from from my experience is the best way of, of finding out how you could support each other or just provide support back and forwards or whatever that relationship might look like. And yeah, so having that, that relationship um, and ideally a deeper relationship of trust really helps that, um, that process kick along. Lovely, thanks Adele. Great, um, Perth Group, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Gary um, yeah, on the subject of the reciprocal relationships, when we're having one-on-ones with politicians, what strategies can we employ? And if we don't have the reciprocal quality, why would they want to speak to us? Can we wow. What that can um, make them want to speak to us? Do we have any leverage? That, that could be a, a broader strategic question um, that, I don't know what sort of what your strategy looks like, so it might be a challenging one for me to just jump in on. Um, but I think a point you raised there was that you might be, you might get a conversation with them and realise that it's not, um, you know, they're not actually wanting to engage at that same level as you are. And if that's the case, you need to respect that no matter who it is. If, if they're not prepared to share and go as deep as you might want to go, oh well. Um, you might need to find some other way or someone else to have that conversation. Um, but yeah, as for, as for getting a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a politician, but yeah, that's another question and probably lots of people have ideas about how you'd, how you'd do that. Um, you can certainly start by just asking. Um, and as I said before, being clear about what, what you're wanting to get out of that conversation. Um, and yeah, I, I guess, being careful about where that fits into your strategy too and, mm. and they might respond to that. Mm. And I'll just add often where we're able to be reciprocal is in things like, um, you know, parliamentarians love positive press and photo opportunities and stuff that they can come to and stuff that gets their name out there. So like, you know, co-authoring an opinion piece together that is about the topic that we're interested in, you know, that's something that helps us, but it also helps them you know, puts their name out there, shows them to doing something positive. So, you know, there are ways of having a reciprocal relationship um, and you just got to be thinking creatively about what that is and, and what understanding what their interest is and what your interest is and where they cross over and where they met, like fit well together and where they're actually quite different and they're, ne they're not going to cross over. <laughs> going back to your Venn diagram, Adele. Um, and I'm going to throw to Sue Packham now just for um, the last word on... Uh, do you want to just uh, briefly tell us about having a coffee with your MP, Sue? And uh, we've got about a minute, so just keep it quick. Thanks. Well, thanks, Gina. <clears throat> this was um, a new MP who had been recently elected to our electorate, and I realised that it wasn't a one-on-one, -on -one, it was on a two-to-one basis. Um, 
M and I spoke with this guy in a cafe in, in Belgrave and we were able to establish areas of common ground as well as, well as areas of difference. And I do remember with some um, re um, reluctance the, the fact that I got a bit upset with something that he said um, but it didn't. It didn't. Um, it didn't kill our relationship or our beginning relationship because he wanted to keep on about the poverty issue. He had other groups who were knocking on his door to be heard as well. So we had that in common, and I think that was um, the, the main thing we got out of that chat was that we realised there was a common element. Cool. Thanks well, for sharing that, Sue. <laughs> It's very cool. And um, yeah, that is, we often talk about finding, you know, finding common ground and that really does come from sharing our stories and figuring out, you know, what, what is each of us trying to achieve and how can we help each other? Um, but also, you know, what is it that we're asking for and how do we build accountability to each other as well? Um, thank you, Adele, so much for joining us today. Um, I'd just like to welcome our CEO, Marie Nutt, um, to speak now, if you can just unmute yourself, Marie, and uh, Marie's going to offer a few reflections and um, her own thanks to you today. Okay, uh, thanks, Gina. Uh, I'm loving the technology. It's it's very exciting to see everybody and um, make sure that I'm yeah also um, doing the right things in front of the camera. So um, thank you for being our inaugural Zoom guest speaker <laughs> um, and and thank you for for um, you know touching on some some really important foundations for results Gina and I were discussing you know this month's action this week and and it is really about building foundations within our groups um, so that then we can use these really important skills for going forward out into the broader community and then with our parliamentarians. And, and one of the things that um, you said before was about trust. I think trust is hugely important. You know, we really need to be able to feel that we can trust each other in this work um, because we need to be working together and 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 without trust um you know that that's very difficult so so having these conversations uh, and building that trust is important and and i guess when i was listening to you just thinking that you know it's so easy to send people texts and you know sit behind our emails but you've obviously been sharing some of your great skills for doing some of the old fashioned stuff, I have to say. So really thank you for um, providing your insights and input and just thank you to everybody for being so fantastic with this new technology as well. Thank you, Marie. And thanks everyone for so keenly listening and tuning in and thanks for all the amazing work you do. Thanks Adele. Feel free to take yourselves off mute everybody and give Adele a clap. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The, good, the good thing about video now is even if we can't hear, we can see that we're clapping, so <laughs> that's, that's half of it. Adele, feel free to stick around if you would like, but also feel free to drop off if you've got other things to do with your Sunday afternoon, because um, we're going to go on to some announcements and activities and things. <laughs> Thanks, Adele. See ya. Um, Marie, can I hand back to you for announcements now? I hope you've got those in front of you. Maybe not. You're still on mute, by the way. <laughs> um, sorry about that, everybody. I haven't gone through my notes. I thought that was my only part, Gina. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I can, I can do the announcements. It's no big deal. <laughs> Uh, I think you're much better off at speaking about the white paper and the study tour and I'm happy to say a couple of words about the international conference and the polio event. Yeah, cool. No drama. Uh, so I'd just like to remind everybody to mark our annual study tour to Canberra in your diary. It goes from the 12th to the 15th of August. Um, so two days of training and preparation 
two days of meeting parliamentarians at Parliament House. Um, plus, you need to be willing to, about six to eight weeks before the study tour itself, um, be doing preparation, so getting the meetings, spending time on the phone, calling up the MPs and uh, securing the meetings. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great way to build your skills in meeting with parliamentarians. So that's the 12th to the 15th of August inclusive. Um, and we'll have more information coming out about that soon, but please do mark it in your diary. Similarly, if you're a group leader or a group partner in a group, or if you're someone who has aspirations to be a group leader at Results, um, we have our leadership retreat coming up on the 24th and 25th of June in Sydney. Um, invitations have gone out to the people who are already group leaders and group partners. So um, you should have seen that by now if you, if you fall into one of those categories. If you haven't, please get in touch with me. Um, and if you're someone who thinks, you know, you'd love to be a leader in results one day and you would love to come along, please also do just get in touch um, and I'd love to pass on the details to you. I'd like to uh, pass on a big thank you to our Results Hobart group for raising almost $3,700 at their quiz night. So everyone can do a, a silent applause and a woo, one of those ones. Very nice. Um, <laughs> you can see it, see? Um, so thank you, thank you so much for that um, and a, a great effort and a really fun night. And I also want to share, um, some of you might already know this, but um, so we made submissions to the Foreign Affairs White Paper a couple of months ago. So submissions ended at the end of February and um, all the submissions are now available online to look at. And so I was really curious. I went through and I wanted to see, um, you know, how we how we kind of fit into the landscape of white paper submissions. And so I found, you know, counted them all up and figured out how many were done by individual people versus organisations and whatnot. Um, and submissions, originally written submissions by individuals, results volunteers accounted for a little bit under 10% of the entire number of submissions put in for the foreign policy white paper which I thought was pretty amazing because we don't account for 10% of Australia's anything else. <laughs> um, so, like, you've definitely outdone yourselves and congratulations. Um, I'll throw it to Marie now to talk a bit about the International Conference and the polio event. Uh, thank you so much, Gina. Yeah, I, I think that white paper example is one where results, again, really punched above its weight. So huge thanks to you all for um, your participation in that. And again, a quick thanks, um, enormous thanks to um, Results Hobart for their ongoing fabulous fundraising. So international conference, uh, every year uh, results in the US hold what is for them a national conference, but it is where all of the results uh, are partner countries and all of our other partners are able to come. So it is really uh, an international conference. It's on the 22nd to the 25th of July in Washington, DC. It's lovely and warm. You get to sort of escape the, the uh, Tassie, Melbourne, Sydney, less so Brisbane winter or Perth. Um, and uh, it's a really fantastic way to see the power of results at a global level. So if you are at all, even the tiniest bit thinking about whether you could um, make that that time to, to come to the international conference. There will be some staff going along to the conference and um, it's a great opportunity to connect with people from around the world doing just what you're doing to, um, to have some incredible meetings and participate in some wonderful um, learnings uh, in workshops. So please get in touch with Gina um, at info at results.org.au uh, if you're at all interested in that. And we'd love to, to have some volunteers come along to the conference. And finally, um, one of the things that the staff have been working on, and you may have read in various Facebook or Twitter um, activity, is that we've been working on the One Last Push campaign for polio. So making sure that within the next couple of years, through continued Australian aid funding, as well as other donors, that polio is 
actually eradicated from the planet. And we are only a few years away from that with just uh, a handful of cases this year and 37 cases last year. So I was pleased to be part of a panel session um, in Sydney uh, last Thursday night with the international head of the polio um, campaign for UNICEF, as well as a senior director of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative based in Geneva and a, and a senior Australian Rotary person. And it was a great event, um, but I just wanted to share that one of the things that I was able to use in that event was storytelling. And I was told that um, the storytelling was the most engaging part of the panel. So these skills that we're learning in these um, monthly calls, I'm learning and utilizing myself just as much as you are. But um, more on our polio campaign through our news and our social media over coming months. Awesome, thanks Marie. And, um, we, we also, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, our um, fellow staffer and long-time results person, aficionado, Mark Rice. This month is his 30th anniversary, his 30th year uh, at results, uh, which is pretty extraordinary. He's been at results as long as I've been alive. So um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So uh, please also everybody just give a, Give a bit of appreciation to Mark. Congratulations on 30 years, Mark. Absolutely extraordinary. And uh, yeah, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder who amongst this crop will be a, a 30 year person in future. Uh, can I throw now to Alyssa to uh, have Ruby and Ryan share their stories of self from our last month's action. Alyssa. Yeah. Um, so I guess this follows on really well from what Marie was just saying about how well the storytelling worked at the polio event. Um, Cause after last month's action call, we did send action, which was to start developing your story of self. And we have had two people who have done a very good job of that. And we're going to actually hear a bit of their stories. So I've got Ruby and Ryan um, to talk to you, but could I talk to Ruby first, please? If she's there. Sure she is, I saw her before. Hi, I'm here, yep. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so did you want to read out um, your story quickly? Sure, I can do. Um, okay, so this is maybe not 100% polished, um, but hopefully it's at least off to a solid start. So my mum always told me that I could be anything I wanted to be. My dad was a bit more realistic. He told me that if I was studious, had a solid work ethic, invested my savings wisely, I could be anything I wanted to be, except maybe a fairy. Um, but I believed him until I was about eight. Our class, when I was eight years old, sponsored a young boy in Kenya called Neem. Um, we wrote letters to him, we fundraised for him, we sent photos and we got some in return. And I remember that he always had this huge smile on his face. He had threadbare clothes and no shoes on his feet. And it was around this time and through this that I realised that what my dad had told me wasn't a lie, but it also didn't apply to Neem, who was in Kenya and didn't have shoes. Because no matter how hard he worked or studied or invested his savings, um, he was going to have to rely on the generosity of complete strangers like me in my class um, just, to, just to put food on the table and to survive. And I realised that that wasn't very fair. So from the age of eight, I started to participate in fundraisers and, and everything that I could. I wanted to raise awareness and make a difference and, and shout about how unfair this was. So I did readathons and jump rope challenges and lapathons and sausage sizzles. I turned school assignments into awareness and fundraising campaigns for the Wildlife Foundation. I shaved my head to raise money for cancer. I did everything. And I did it because I realised that it wasn't just that... Neem was in a different country, was that he was less fortunate because of where he'd been born. I had been born in Australia and therefore I went to school every day, I wore shoes every day and I had like a packed lunch every single day and Neem was born in Kenya so he relied on donations of, from people like me and from people like my classroom of students just so that him and his little sister could go to school and maybe get a pair of shoes. 
So that was when I sort of, you know, understood the un unfairness and what I tried to do about it. By the time I left high school, though, I had become exhausted and deflated. I realised that for all my hard work, the world had not become a better place. Um, there was still just so much injustice. And at that time as well, there was the rise of social media, which meant that I felt like I was seeing more and more about the injustice in the world. And I had my eyes opened up to so much more and yet not the tools to do anything about it or any suggestions for a solution. This was just too much. So I kind of gave up, I guess. It took some years for that drive, I guess, to return. Um, and it, it was when I started working full time that I wanted to do something again. So I became a regular donor to some of my favorite charities. But donating money left me feeling disconnected. And I wanted to feel like I was doing something, not just handing over a few dollars each month. And I realized that to make a difference, it would take more than my donations. It would take a movement. To fight inequality, we would have to work together. We would have to unite people around the world with the issues that are most urgent to those most vulnerable. And I'm privileged enough to have a voice and I want to use it to tell those that have power to make a difference that it needs to be made and that it can be made, that it is possible. So I chose to, come, I chose to join Results. Results is a movement that unites people around the world with those issues. And it gives me a platform where I can connect with other people and we together can make these changes and speak with our voices united to those with the power to make a difference. So I lost my place on the page. Um, I'm privileged to have that voice and Neem is unable to do that. So now as a, as a student in my class, we raise money so that Neem and his little sister could go to school wearing a pair of shoes. Now I want to raise my voice so that his whole community, his whole country and people like him all around the world don't have to go through such a thing. Thank you. Ruby, I really liked the start and talking about your dad and your mum around the dinner table. Um, but you did say it's not polished yet. So I was wondering, how long have you been working on it and how much has it changed since the first version that you wrote? So I've been working on this for about um, probably two weeks on and off. Um, I actually do have another version, but it's saved on a different computer, which is why I couldn't read that today. Um, but I, yeah, I've been working on it for about two weeks. I had a really good chat with Gina um, and also with um, Alicia, who's another one of the group leaders here, who were really great at adding some questions um, and sort of questioning, you know, but why did that matter? What did that change for you? What did that moment, you know? And what was really interesting was through the whole process as well was that I hadn't thought about Neem in Kenya for like literally 10 years, I don't think. And I didn't realise how much of an impact it had on me back then until I started thinking, until I started working backwards. Um, when Gina was asking, so why did you, like, what was the first thing that you did? And I looked all the way back and sort of thought, oh, well, in my class, you know, we had that world vision kid and, you know, that sort of, I guess, was where it started. And then I remembered all of this stuff about him and how it made me feel. So it was actually a really cool experience for me just to, you know, backtrack and find that moment and think about him again. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to get back in touch with that teacher and tell her how much it affected me really. Yeah. That's really nice to hear. That's um, it's really great that you've been doing that. Uh, and can I speak to, do you want to hear Ryan's story? Ryan's there. I think I see him really up. Is Ryan still there from? Yes, Denver? yeah, I'm still here. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. So did yep. you want to hear me? That's, that's right, yeah, I just can't hear you very well, uh, Alyssa, but I might start off, yeah, just by sharing my story. Um, so as a child, I absolutely hated eating vegetables. Um, it, it was the one thing I couldn't uh, stand at, at dinner time. Uh, but my parents made me sit uh, at the dinner table uh, until I had finished what was uh, on my plate. I think that's because my mum had a very hard sort of upbringing. And so she herself understood the value of having uh, fresh uh, fruit and vegetables on the table and 
uh, a good bit of meat and, and protein when she could get it. Um, and I think she tried to pass on the, the value of, of having um, good food um, when, when we could get it as well. Um, but me being the, the stubborn little kid I, I was, I continued to refuse to, to eat my vegetables. So one night she dragged me across to the, the computer. She opened up Google uh, and she Googled starving kids in, in Africa. Um, and of course, these, these kids had no food whatsoever. And you could see the, the, the absolute look of devastation on their face and how malnu um, malnourished they were. Um, but I really, at that point, I really didn't care too much. But if you fast forward to today, things are very different. Now, we've all got our reasons for being involved uh, in organisations like Results. Um, but for me, something that drives me is my Christian faith. Um, and I think it compels me to act. Um, now, uh, around the country, if we've got any other people of faith like myself, I think we can all agree that we use the example of Jesus, who was a strong advocate for those who were discarded by society and were compelled to follow in his footsteps. And I guess another reason is I'm a lot more exposed to the world. As children, we are uh, very much insulated, I guess, um, from what's really going on. Every now and again, we might get a, a little bit of a snipper on the, on the news of, of something happening overseas or in our own backyard. But as we grow up, we start to see these things um, on, our, on our own streets. For example, I, I see that the struggles of, of homeless people, and particularly young homeless people uh, on the streets here, here in Adelaide. Um, and it's these sort of things that challenge my belief in one of the, the things that I value the most is equal opportunity. And it doesn't sadden me, but it rather angers me that in 2017, this is the, the 21st century and not everyone has that equal opportunity to, to succeed and, and reach their, their full potential um, like so many of us here in Australia have, have been given. So when I put all of this together, I want to be able to give others the opportunities I've had. But for me, it's not just about helping just one person. It's helping as many people as I can. And when I see the, the work results does, um, it's one of the things that um, uh, really drove me to, to sign up and, and join results in the, in the first place because we can achieve uh, change on, on, the, on the macro level. And I think for, for those of you wondering, yes, I definitely do eat all of my vegetables now and I can tell you how tasty they are. <laughs> Love it. Right. Um, so I wanted to ask as well, that's a very, I guess, it, the story covers a big chunk of your life and in the process of writing it, was there anything that you really learned about yourself or something that came up that you weren't expecting? Um, I think it was just the, the whole process of uh, doing a story of self. I think before this, I haven't had uh, a chance to really reflect on who I am as a person. And I think I've really started to understand the, the value of doing that to actually um, look at what you value um, uh, and what your values are and how that can perhaps drive your purpose in life and what you really want to be able to, um, I guess, get out of life and, and perhaps um, and, and do for others. Um, so I think it's been a, it's a really good process and I think everyone would agree that these sort of stories are going to continue to develop. Um, they're going to start from, from something very small, um, you know, that's been put together, but they are going to evolve over time. As we, we learn more, we open ourselves to new experiences. Um, and that evolves our story of self. Um, it evolves our values as well. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's been yeah, really, really good to, yeah, just uh, be able to, to reflect and, and yeah, find out a bit more about who I am and, and what I value. Okay, thank you so much. I think, yeah, that's, it's really important to think about everyone's value and take it as a, 
kind of process of, of learning about yourself as well. Um, mm. Something that stick with me uh, when I was reading it was even if you don't have any experience of poverty or of international aid whatsoever, that in itself is really amazing because you're still trying to do something about it right now. So that's why, I guess, why you want to. So thank you for sharing your stories. Um, it was really helpful and I'll pass you back to Jim. Cool. Thanks so much, Alyssa. Um, and uh, to hear one last story, Ramil, I wonder if you're able to share your story in like two minutes, your story of self. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, the sound's a little scratchy, so just um, speak clearly. Because it, it shows that the internet is we had a big connection actually so uh, first of all thank you for inviting me to this meeting Gina and it was very interesting to hear to then listen the stories of uh, of the participants and also the work the work actions what uh, they are doing and uh, as regarding uh, to me, actually, my uh, story is uh, more about even a story of my country rather than you know, myself, because um, uh, maybe some and, uh, they might hear about the Poma, one of the biggest countries in the world, which was the Soviet Union, and I'm I was born in Soviet Union. And actually, uh, my country for the moment uh, was one of the part of that bigger, bigger state. Uh, so I'm from Azerbaijan. And uh, for the moment, Azerbaijan is an independent country. And uh, I remember when I was 13 years old, uh, the Soviet army, uh, it was 1990, uh, 20th of January, and uh, the Soviet armed forces entered Baku, and uh, they, because there was a threat uh, to the Soviet Union's collapse, which was happened actually after one year, but it was almost started from my city, the process of collapse, how to say, and uh, that night, actually, the, a lot of people died, and uh, my attitude to the whole system was changed that day. After gaining independence, I was uh, the one who is the nation and we were, uh, it, you, uh, it was organizations of young lawyers and we were trying to promote uh, new values of human rights, democracy among our people. And uh, unfortunately from the Soviet time we inherited a lot of, uh, how to say, the, the bad things, which is one, one of the things is that the, uh, the, the old law system and one of the um, legal systems which can be considered as an inheritance from Soviet system is a juvenile justice system. And currently I work on the juvenile justice issues for the organization no, it's a UN agency who is working for children protection, and we work with uh, uh, people uh, in five districts. Those who has uh, problems with uh, with uh, with the law, the children who are uh, committing legal delinquencies, committing crimes, and we work with the people, uh, with their families, uh, with the uh, families in those districts. In our system, since I said that it was inherited from the Soviet time, uh, we have uh, we we have no uh, proper child sensitive approach in our legal, and they treated those children who commit uh, 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 who offend, who are offenders. They treated as an almost as an adult, not as a children, and there is no specific approach on to eliminate this kind of approach and therefore we use a lot of tactics such as one-to-one -one meetings, in-house meetings with the community members and also with the local 
Uh, and one important thing I want uh, to mention at the end, it was about your discussions about how to engage local politicians and local governance. It's very important and it's very important. But the risk is that, uh, as uh, one of your participants said, sometimes they might not be engaged into discussions. And therefore, we need to, how to say, to consider not only our interests, benefits what might fit of those politicians uh, by involving into the process with us as well so it is yeah. very important in that you know, awesome. so we thank are you. trying to from that. yeah thank cool. you thank you so much Ramil for sharing your story and um little clap uh for sharing your story and uh, for, for telling us a bit about how that informs your work. And I invited Ramil on just because uh, it's a completely different context, completely different work, um, but driven by similar values. And you can see how the story of self, um, you know, how that sounds in, in different contexts. Um, we do need to, to finish the call, but um, I would like to just ask if people can stick around for five minutes. Um, I'd love to do an interactive role play to demonstrate the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you're feeling pretty confident and like you don't really need to stick around, then please feel free to, free to drop off. Um, next month's call will be on Sunday, May 28th, 3.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. And it'll be through Zoom the exact same way. Um, the only difference is you'll add a number one on the end of the meeting ID, a number one on the end of the URL. Uh, but otherwise, everything will be the same. If you can stick around for five minutes, please do. Um, I know some people can't. I know Perth can't, so they just dropped. Um, <laughs> they were getting kicked out of their room. Um, but if you can stick around, please do. And can I invite Lindsay to unmute in Hobart? And what we're going to do is a bit of an interactive role play. So an interactive role play is where uh, it's not just me talking to Lindsay, but everyone gets to chime in. It's a bit like a pantomime. She's behind you. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to set the scene um, and I'm going to go through the five steps of a one-on-one. -on -one. So setting the scene. So let's say it's a Wednesday night. I'm at a screening of a movie about child soldiers, let's say. When the movie ends, there's a brief question and answer session with the host of the screening, which is the University School of Political Science. There's a young woman sitting in front of me. Lindsay, who appears to be very moved and she asks a question of the panel. Um, and she asks, well, you know, through some tears, some, some moist eyes, what an ordinary person can do about this issue. So what's our first step in the five steps of having a one-on-one? -on -one? What's the first step? Can someone unmute and tell us what it is? And I just want to note, Sue, I have seen your question and I will address it in um, <coughs> Attention. Attention, yep, so I need to get her attention. She's sitting in front of me. Um, what can I do to get her attention? Besides faking a seizure, which probably isn't the best idea. Empathise with her. Empathise with her. So what might I do then? What would that look like? It would look like actually being close to her and, and saying, I get what you're saying or I, I can see what you mean. Yeah, so say the question and answer is over. So I might walk up to Lindsay, you know, she's in front of me. Uh, I'll reach over. I might tap her on the shoulder. I might offer her a tissue. You know, I might do any number of things. So let's say I catch, a, catch her eye and I say, hey, you know, are you all right, Lindsay? You, that was pretty heavy, wasn't it? And Lindsay Jonathan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was pretty heavy. Like I was I was quite moved. I can see you were too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've I've got two young kids. Um, and just watching those children go through that process, I, I can't even imagine. Um, and it, yeah, I was surprised by how much it touched me. Yeah, same. I mean, I I know that I was in tears throughout a lot of the movie and I kept thinking back to when I was a child and I mean I was scared of the dark and there's just no way I would have been coping with what those kids were coping with when I was their age, you know? Yeah, so unfair that they have to go through that. No child should go through that. Mm, definitely. Um, okay, and I'm just going to pause here. So the, what's the next step? I've caught her attention. We've started chatting. 
Interest. Interest, yep. So establishing interest in uh, having a chat, establishing interest in us having uh, a relationship. And, I mean, the way this might look in this context is Lindsay might have to get home to her kids, right? So uh, Lindsay might, it might just be like, hey, well, you know, let's, let's have a chat later on Wednesday or whatever. But let's say that we can, we can stick around and we can have the conversation all in one go. Uh, so I'm going to say something to Lindsay like, uh, so we were just talking about our response to the movie. Um, Lindsay, you know, you mentioned, um, you asked the question about what people can do. Um, you know, what, what sort of stuff do you get up to? You know, what was it that brought you along to this movie? Oh, well, uh, a friend of mine was uh, coming along and I hadn't been um, out for, for an evening out for quite some time. So she persuaded me to go uh, with me. I wasn't really, I, I thought it would be a fun night out, but it seems to have turned into something more than that. I feel like I really need to do something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm really glad you asked that question. And, you know, it sounds like you're keen to do something. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm involved with a group called results and I guess I'm similarly driven to do something when I see problems in the world and I've found that through results um, I'm able to do something about the issue of extreme poverty which we saw in the movie was a real driver of these kids ending up being um, child soldiers. Yes. I'd, I'd love to talk I'd love to talk to you more about how um, about that and how you you might be able to get involved with us and, and take some action on this issue would you like would you like that? Yeah well what what kind of stuff do, do you guys do? Cool. I'm just going to pause it there. Um, so I'm paying attention to Lindsay's body language. She's leaning towards me. She's saying yes. You know, she's interested in having a chat. Then what's the next phase? The next step, step number three. And this is where our story of self comes into it, Sue. So step mm. number three is... Exploration. 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 Good. And look, we'll do a very short version of this, but... You know, what, what, might, what sort of stuff might I talk to Lindsay about here? Uh, well, how, what motivated you to, to get involved? Yeah, I'll share my story. I asked Lindsay her story. Um, you know, who are you? What are you about? What, what drives you? Like, you know, what kind of world do you want to see? What problems do you see that need fixing? What do you, what do you think is the best way a person can make a difference? What do, you, what do you do with your time? <laughs> why did you choose that? Why, why do this and not that? Um, and we won't go through all that right now, but asking lots of questions about each other and just exploring. You know, I know she's got two kids. What else? Do, what, does she, what does she do? Does she, has she studied? What networks does she have? What kind of challenges is she facing in trying to reach her goals? What, what challenges am I facing? How could she help? What's the next step? So after we've explored and gotten to know each other a bit, what comes next? Step four. Step <laughs> four. Exchange. <laughs> Exchanges. Thank you, Melbourne. Exchanges. So helping each other or making some plans to help each other in the future. So let's say we've explored a bit and I say, well, Lindsay, uh, well, Lindsay, you know, I, I'm really, um, I'm really, quite moved by your commitment to wanting to do something when you see a problem in the world. Um, and I know that next week there's a, there's a talk happening back here actually about, um, about how to get politically involved and how to be involved in democracy. Um, I'm planning on coming along. Do you want to come with me? Uh, what day was that, Gina? Sorry? Yeah, it's next Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Um, Oh, I might have to shift something um, because um, obviously I've got my uh, kids and, and my partner is, is working that night. But let me see what I can do. Um, is there a, a phone number that I can uh, contact you on or can I give you mine? Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's exchange details. And yeah, anyway, so we'll go on to do that. We'll pause it there. We don't need to actually do that now. <laughs> so we figure out exchanges. You know, I might discover that Lindsay really wants to learn more. So come along to this thing with me. I might say, hey, my results meeting is coming up this Sunday. I think you would be really fantastic in our group because we're looking for someone who has, you know, stuff that she says she has. Why don't you come along? We're having a fundraiser. Why don't you bring your kids? It's a movie. Um, exchanges and helping. So, oh, Lindsay, there's this, there's this book I read that it, I'm sure you'd be really interested in it because it's about 
whatever you're interested in. So we're making exchanges. We're looking for ways we can help each other. Um, we might start doing that straight away or we might do that into the future. And then finally, what's our last step? Last step. Commitment. Step five, commitment. Yep. So that's where we make our promise to either meet up again, um, continue our relationship somehow. So I'm asking Lindsay to come along next Wednesday night to this discussion thing. Uh, we've switched phone numbers. Um, you know, we've swapped numbers. We've, you know, I, I might ask her, is it okay if I call you and set up time to have coffee and talk some more? So, you know, like I say, it's not rocket science, but um, it's very much intuitive, but it's also very much making that invisible stuff visible. So uh, thanks so much, Lindsay, for your demonstration skills. And I will end the call now because uh, I have gone over and I apologise for that. Um, thanks, everyone, so much for joining. For, for support, please do contact info at results.org.au. And, of course, please let us know about any successes that you have. Uh, we do love hearing about them. And please do report your actions that you're taking at results.org.au forward slash report. That's where you can let us know that you've sent a letter or organised a meeting or you're running a fundraiser or whatever you're doing. Our next action call takes place Sunday, May 28th, 3.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Once again, it will be on Zoom, exactly the same as we've done today, but with one really important difference. The meeting ID will have an extra number one at the end and so will the joining URL. So we'll send out the details again. Um, it just means that when you join, you will click on a URL with a one on the end. Uh, and if you're joining by phone, you'll just have to add a one to the meeting ID that you punch in. We'll send that all out, um, just add a one. Very simple, but just know that just look out for that difference next month. As always, there will be a recording of this call made available and sent out tonight or tomorrow um, if anyone wants to review today's call or share it with somebody else. And I'll leave you today with the words of John Maxwell, who said, leadership is not about titles, positions, or flowcharts. It is about one life influencing another. So go out, be leaders, and influence each other. Have a great afternoon, and goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank Feel you. free to unmute oh, and say goodbye. Bye. Nice to see everyone. See ya. Bye.